everybody. I hope that you all enjoyed seeing you today. <laughs> My father actually comes from this region, in a small settlement out of Sisimiut. Uh, he comes from there. I have made uh, quite a few slides. That's just only pictures, just to give an idea of what uh, what I'm talking about of this country. My name is Adika Hammond. Adika is a Greenlandic word, and it means uh, big sister to younger brothers. <laughs> and then you say, how come you know? How come you, your name is Adika, big sister to younger brothers, when you're first born? <laughs> when I was born, everybody thought that I was going to get a, I was going to be a, bro, a, a boy. And it's very important that the firstborn is a boy when I come from a community where hunting is the main income and uh, hunters are vital to a community. And my, I come from a very traditional home. So when they found out that I'm a girl, my mother cried for two days. <laughs> she was a girl. <laughs> but I think uh, I'm her favorite today. <laughs> I have two brothers, uh, they're both uh, living off the land, they're both hunters and fishermen, living as traditional as we possibly can. So this is our flag, Greenland. The flag symbolizes sunrise over the ice cap. We are a country, oh yeah. this is me. I'm dressed uh, like the Trudy people do, and this is, uh, this is how I was for seven weeks out on ice back in 2002. I've been traveling around the world a lot since I was very young. Before I turned 25, I have visited 50 different kinds of countries. And I'm passionate travel around the world. And the more I travel outside my own country, the more I learned of myself. Because wherever I was going, they have never met a Greenlander before. <laughs> and wherever I met, they didn't know that Greenland was inhabited. <laughs> so I was wandering around and had to tell a lot that, yeah, we are a lot of people, we are all 56,000 people. <laughs> and a lot of people are saying, you are only 56,000 people when you come from the biggest island of the world. How can you survive being so few? I answer back. How can you survive being so many? <laughs> so we are very much bound to our environment. In 2002, I decided to travel in my own country in the polar region of Greenland. Even though I come from a region where we go out with the dog teams and where we go out hunting on dog teams, still I chose to travel in a place, the most remote area of Greenland, I wanted to go to a polar bear hunting. I wanted to experience walrus hunting. I wanted to be out on ice for seven weeks and no mirror, no shower, no nothing. Just experience everyday life of our polar region of Greenlanders. It was the best time ever in my life. I survived. <laughs> and uh, it was there when I felt that I have a good age. In 2002, I was turning 40 and I was thinking like, I have more energy than I can, I can possibly ever use. Instead of being a pro professional critic from the site to the country, how it's being run, I, did decide, I decided to run for parliament. I have never got any encouragement and nobody ever thought that I would. They were just saying, why? <laughs> and I say, if I want to be part of a change, I'd be part of that. And I got a good election. And uh, later on, I became the first female premier of this country. I used to do, I used to do dog mushing myself. I had 12 dogs, and I always competed against men, or men competing against me. <laughs> so becoming a politician amongst many men, for me it was absolute normal. You, have to, you just have to beat them. <laughs> Greenland, a lot of, for a lot of people, Greenland lies in a very remote area of the world. And uh, a lot of people are saying that you live so far away from everything. But if you look at the map, the world map, you will see we are just right in the center of everything. <laughs> we are the closest neighboring country to the North Pole. And uh, 
We have been living in Greenland for the last four and a half thousand years. I uh, and my family and the Greenlanders here are d direct descendants of uh, Tulip culture, and uh, we have been living in Greenland ever since. The biggest island of the world with 18 towns, all living along the coastline, and uh, 60 settlements. That tells a little bit about 56,000 people living very scattered around a huge country. The biggest island of the world is almost size-wise equivalent to Australia, but Australia is a continent. So it's, uh, it's approximately the same size. I myself come from Umanna, that is where the G is to Greenland, a little bit further south in Umanna. And uh, my boyfriend Tom is from Iduliset, where we're going tomorrow. Just to give you a little bit of uh, an, an, an idea. Our language is Greenlandic, which is an Inuit language, because we are Inuit people. We are directly coming from Mongolia, and it's DNA proven that we are Mongolian race. When we are born, we have a big, uh, this size of a blue spot over our bones. And it's called the Mongolian spot. I think uh, you guys had it also, right? Yeah. It disappears approximately when we are three years of age. I call it the trademark of God. <laughs> And it disappears approximately when we are about three years old, and it doesn't come back again. Only Mongolian race people have that. And so is it here. And uh, if you notice, when you have been walking around town, you notice that uh, our men don't have full, be full beard. They only have a little bit of beard like my boyfriend Tom has. Stand up a little, show your beard. <laughs> This, this, is as, this is as good as it gets. <laughs> but I think it's very quite sexy. And you probably also notice that our men, you don't see any all men. We, we, don't, we don't lose our hair. We never adopted that trend you have. <laughs> and, it's, uh, and it's quite, you know, it's, it's better with that. <laughs> and also probably you notice that uh, our noses are a little bit round compared to you guys. Our noses can be pressed flat, absolute flat. And uh, we don't get frostbites in our noses. <laughs> it's a smart thing to have. <laughs> As I told you yesterday, the captain is in charge of the good weather and Peter is in charge of the bad weather. We are in charge of the northern lights. <laughs> it is the time where the northern lights, you probably would be seeing it every single day if there is a chance of seeing it where there's no cloud, cloudy weather, this time of the year. And um, there's actually a trick if you want to see them. And uh, if, if they're not around, you have to whistle. <whistles> Make it sound like a, like a sound in the, in the wind, in snowy wind. You have to make the same sound. It attracts the northern lights, they get curious and they want to dance along to your whistling. <laughs> it's not a joke. <laughs> and uh, that's because they are the spirits of our ancestors up in the sky. They're having a nice time waiting for us, for us to pass on, but also they're playing ball. They're, they're having fun. They, they just have so much energy and uh, time that they're playing ball up there. That's why they move so fast. And that's how we always said about the Northern Lights. And uh, the official language of this country is Greenlandic, the Inuit language. The Inuit in Canada speak the same, almost. Alaska and Inupiaq speak also almost the same. And Chukotka and Inuit also speak it almost the same. I was in Alaska last month, and I spoke with the elderly Inupiaq people. I understood everything and he understood everything I said, which I think is, uh, is quite unique because many of the youngest don't speak Inupiaq language anymore. I had to come all the way from Greenland to speak his language. <laughs> so, our neighbors closest is Iceland, 
and Canada. And uh, we wandered from, uh, from Mongolia over to the Russian area, Alaskan, Canadian, and all the way to Greenland. This is my mother. My mother turned 75 years this year, and uh, she flew down to Luke to be with us because my brother and, and, and I live in Luke. And uh, my mother became a widower of age 27. Our father was a hunter and he fell through the ice with his dog team and was never found. And uh, with three, three small children, she decided to live alone. And she said that uh, I don't want to risk to marry, remarry and the man doesn't love my children the same way as I love them. So she doesn't even want to take that chance and uh, chose to live alone. And she lives in Umanna, one town further north than Iruri said where we're going tomorrow. She's a wonderful woman. This is a typical picture of our men. That's, you notice the beard, you see the hair, and the, so, see the looks, because we are Mongolian, that's where the good looks are coming from. <laughs> Very often you would see Greenlanders go around without gloves, you wouldn't see them with hats, even though it's quite cold for you. But that's because we have a specific, uh, I, I call it my specific uh, circulation, and that keeps us always warm hands and uh, warm hats. I have never seen my boyfriend sleep with a blanket, even in winter. It's always, body heat is, is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is, it is. It is. Look, it's a typically a woman from East Greenland. You saw? He's taken. He's, he's taken. He's taken. He's, he's taken. You can test hug him. <laughs> Cheers to people. Cheers. Very important note. Eh? This woman is a, is a friend of ours. She's from East Greenland. And you probably noticed her clothes. It's the same clothes as we saw this afternoon with one of the ladies to show the East Greenland style and also the, her decoration. Greenlandic people, we are keeping us a little bit back. We don't talk that much. Very often, probably you notice when you're walking around in Sisimut, people will have an eye contact to you and uh, they don't go over and say, hi, how are you doing? What can I do for you? Like when I go to a shop in the United States, they come over to me and say, hey there, how are you doing? What can I do for you today? What wonderful weather. And I'm looking at them and I say, have we met? <laughs> but that's the way you, you are, because you, you would not do it here. They would be thinking like, what? Because we don't do the same way of greeting because we see them every single day. And what's, what's happening with them in life, we know from our neighbor. <laughs> And uh, 56,000 of us, in, come on, you know, almost everybody. Uh, my boyfriend know, is related to half of us, and the other half are his friends. It says a little bit about that we know a lot of people. We know everybody in town by name. Most of the time we know when it's their birthday. And when somebody has given a birth, we know. And we go over and, and greet the new baby. So we do a lot of visiting to each other. Coming from a small place, you, you get to know everybody and you get to, you know, do things with them and it's part of your family. So this is what we do. So we don't do this, how are you doing today? They know already anyway. <laughs> so our, our way of greeting just, you know, walking by would be like lifting our eyebrow. So just, just like this, it, it means, how are you, hi, how are you doing? <laughs> How are you doing? What can I do for you today? That's that you do it with an eyebrow. <laughs> and if you do these eyebrows twice, it's a flirt. <laughs> so you just count how many times he's doing that with his eyes. It says a little bit about us. This, you know, we are a little bit laid back and we don't take things, you know, so straight. You know, we, you're around, you, you do fine. For us, it's rude, considered rude, not to greet anybody, not to have eye contact to a person. If you just walk by as if it doesn't exist, it's the rudest thing you can do. So I encourage you to lift your eyebrow to those that when you meet on the street or you know, just get them get them you know, make sure make them notice that you notice them. That's that's the best way. 
Besides Greenlandic being the first language, which is the only official language, we learn Danish also. Danish is our second language, because we still do belong to Kingdom of Denmark, and that we want to split from that, I'll tell you a little later. English is our third language. All three languages are mandatory in school. So we all, uh, in my generation and my boyfriend generation, this was introduced, Greenlandic, Danish, and English in school, and it still is going on so. Later on, I took German, I speak German too, and uh, our boy, uh, the middle boy, is uh, going to learn Japanese as fourth language, and our daughter arrived to France today because he wants to make French as her fourth language. We are a population that is surrounded by ice, 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 ice. Greenland is approximately 2,000 kilometers from north to south, just the ice part of Greenland and it's 1,000 kilometers from west to east, and it's three kilometers thick. We are metric, and uh, it's, it's a whole lot of ice. So when it's ice-free, we do a lot of activities outside. We do a lot of boating. You probably notice a lot of boats all over, small dinghies. It's like a car for you. It's like going on a train for you. For us, it's a kayak and boat. We are going out hunting, we are going out in the fjord, collecting food for the winter. This, this Right now it's salmon season, and it's only wild salmon. We have, no, we have no animals in captivity in Greenland. Everything is wild, everything is up in the mountains and the sea, and uh, they're they are having a free life until we need them. The reason why Greenlanders survived in the Arctic the reason why we survived in Greenland is because we came with the kayak and the dog. This combination for us to be able to go out with the dog teams and also being able to hunt from our kayaks is this combination made us perfect to stay in this Arctic region. Where there's lots of ice, there's lots of plankton. Where there's plank lots of plankton, there's lots of wildlife and fish and whales and seals and polar bears and many other fantastic animals that are perfect for us. Uh, to feed off in, in this region. Because we don't have chicken farms, we, we don't have uh, pigs farms, we don't have uh, cow farms or anything that you have in your country, we are very much uh, relying on the food we can get from our environment. We hunt whale, we hunt seal, we hunt polar bear, we hunt muskox, we hunt reindeer, we hunt everything that's around us, which is a natural habitat, natural surrounding for us for thousands of years. We will continue so for many more years because we will not be able to survive with a few things you can buy in the stores that come from the south. Also, at the same time, it's ecological, it's, it's uh, wild, it's fresh, and uh, it's CO2 free, mm -hmm. or zero. It's environmental correct. And for us, it's sustain sustainability is most important in our life. And self-sustaining is the best way and, and the nicest, uh, healthiest way of living. We go on the dog teams. When we come to Iludisa tomorrow, there are approximately 4,500 people living in Iludisa, which is the third largest town in Greenland. And they have, how many did they say they had? They had uh, around 2,000 dogs. It's not much. It has reduced a lot the recent years because of the ice retrieving, because the ice not being thick enough anymore, because of the climate change. The ice is not setting like a month later than normal and, and disappears also at least a month earlier than normal. That means two, more, two months a year where it's less ice than normal. That means for us to maintain a dog team it's very hard work, and it's also costly. And uh, when the time is reducing, our, you know, our urge to keep them also is being reduced. So climate change also has an impact on us in culturally, but also in our way of life. Still, we have an unwritten law made by our Hunters and Fishermen Association of Greenland that hunting on motorized vehicles on ice is prohibited. Thank you. The reason why we forbid that is because it's the time where
especially in spring, where the seal are having their cuts and uh, the animals are having their babies, and we are not doing unnecessary noise and disturbance to the environment. That's why we have that rule, and I think uh, nobody discusses to change that. We are very proud of our dogs. You probably notice when you're walking around there, they almost look a little bit the same, because it is the Greenland, uh, Greenland Malamut, which is the biggest uh, husky style uh, dog in the world. It's a full blood. We don't allow other dog races to come to Greenland. If you have come with your cute little lap dog, not a lap top, but a lap dog, <laughs> uh, we, we give you two chances. We give you two choices. You travel back with your dog right now, or we shoot it. <laughs> it, it is true. We don't, we, don't, we don't give any dispensation whatsoever. We don't take any chances. We want to keep our dog as a full blood, and it, it has these abilities to be a fantastic working dog, and also can stay outside all year round and withstand the Arctic climate. They are perfect for that, and we don't want to change that. But you have sled dogs from Sisimut upwards, and in East Greenland. You don't have sled dogs south of here because the sea doesn't freeze over the winter. So there's a purpose to why we have dogs from here to no northward. <clears throat> I can I come up with a little bracking? <laughs> when I had when I had my my twelve dogs during the time when I went to to high school senior high school, and I always went out to try to beat the men. When we have been out on a dog team, I want I want I have to go first. I have to go first somewhere, and uh, I always made up uh, you know making a big race with these men. And one day, the Greenland Championship of, uh, of best mushers are coming together. I applied. I want to be part of that. They said, no, you're a girl. <laughs> yeah, but I, I'm a girl with dogs. But back then they said, there's no discussion. You can't, you can't join them. It's not for girls. But anyway, I kept talking and talking and talking and talking. At the end, I could come, but unofficial participant. Do you know what happened? Yeah. I won. <laughs> but, but ever since they changed the rule, we made sure that they changed it today, there are women participating. We are very proud of our culture and heritage as Inuit on, on ice. We love ice. We want to live in a region where there's ice. That's where the good food and the wonderful environment and it's you can see hundreds of kilometers away with your eye no trees disturbing your eye and this is how we like it the fantastic cooperation between man hunter the hunter and his dogs is absolute something you have to experience and how they're listening to each other and how they are giving each other the the, in the signals that both needs but you know the respect goes both ways it's fantastic I see an ability in our men to see the small things, to hear the small things, and also work and see the big things and use lots of energy at the same time. I think they're the, one of the most nicest men in the world. This is how they look like when they're out on the ice. They are, they are proud, they're working very hard, but also at the same time they have this ability of you know just sit there and say nothing for hours. And they're just enjoying the surroundings. And I think uh, that says a lot about the people of Greenland. We spend a lot of time on ice. We are hunting. We are using our skins as camouflage. And uh, we are eating approximately two seals per person in average in this country. Sealing is very important to us. It's one of the most I mean, common source of meat for us. And we eat them, we catch the seals for food, and the, the skins we use for garments, and the fat we use for burning, but also for eating the best omega-3, better than tablets. And uh, because of our sealing, in 1980s, there was a lot of campaigning in Europe uh, against sealing. And uh, especially France was very active with uh, their supermodel, Brigitte Bardot in front uh, as, as, as a beautiful woman, 
saying that we are killing baby seals and we sh they shouldn't buy any seal skins from us. It was a time where it was very difficult for us to survive. As an example, I come from a family where hunting is of, you know, main source of income. We could pay our electricity, we could, we could get clothes to new, new clothes and school books for children all year round because of the skins that they were selling that we didn't need because they were being sold down the store. Because of the campaign, nobody bought our skins anymore. France didn't buy anymore, uh, Belgium stopped, Denmark stopped, Holland stopped, and many other countries in the European Union, they stopped. That means that our source of income, that's probably one of the most important ones, disappeared from one day to the other. Our men were the supporters. Our men were bringing in the, the, the meat and the hides and the income. Suddenly stood there and couldn't sell anything. They no longer could support the families. They no longer can pay for the electricity bills. They no longer could buy the new trousers that the children do need. These men were forced to go down to the community hall and ask for social welfare. See, from being a proud hunter to a person on land living off social welfare went very fast. I bet that I'm somewhere right when I say that quite a few of our men have committed suicide because of this transition. I think that it's very important that countries and animals have a voice. And I think it's the good thing that there are organizations that are keeping you know, uh, a good eye on how things are being done. But nobody is thinking in this matter about what consequences it has to the last hunting people of Earth that's up in the Arctic regions that are having a living of sealing that we still do today. And I think that it is very important for the outside world of the Arctic to understand that there are some consequences that at all times, whatever decision you're taking has a consequence somewhere. Mm -hmm. And you have to be aware of that consequence before you make any vote as a politician anywhere. Anything else, step out. And I think uh, today we have a stronger voice around the world regarding our sustainability, sustainable hunting, about our philosophy behind why we hunt this way we do. And I think that the world has got a more open eye and more open ear to, to, to see what kind of people we are and why we are fighting for our right to hunt as we do today. Right? These, these organization people, they asked us to eat chicken. <laughs> I saw how these chicken are being raised. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, I think a good dialogue is the way ahead, and an important dialogue on the on diplomatic level, but also political level, is it's the key key way. And the way we're seeing our environment comes automatically from our understanding of what the world is. We have always believed that on the bottom of the sea there lives a woman that is in charge of all animals on earth, in the world. Her name is the goddess of the sea, Sesuma Omna. We always believed that before Christianity came to Greenland in 1721. If you have been not a, such a good, if you have not been a good person, for each deed, bad deed you do, it lands as as uh, uh, it messes up her hair. And no woman wants messy hair. <laughs> it's very, very serious business. And uh, we have always believed that. So we always have to keep our taboo rules in order. We have to live right to make sure that she at all times is pleased and will ensure that there will be food enough to all of us. Only if you have been bad to the environment only if you have done something not good to the environment, it will mess up her hair and all the food will stay away. See, this is very simple thinking, but still today, that is probably the route to, to United Nations sustainable goals today. <coughs> and it's very basic, but it's also uh, very important. What you do to environment comes always back to you. In 2014, I brought Ban Ki-moon, General Secretary of the United Nations, to my hometown in Umanna, 
I brought him there. He wanted to see ice cap melting. He wanted to see the hunters' conditions, what kind of conditions they are living under. He wanted to meet the local hunters that are making a living off the ice. He wanted to be out there where the men were on the ice, and he did. I think he got a frostbite in both his toes, but he didn't say that. He only said that after we have left. But I think that this kind of leadership around the world is very important to have. Not only do they read of it, not only are they, do they have advisors that are telling them that climate change really does happen. They want to experience it at their first hand. They want to talk to the people that are there and also see what's going on with his own eyes. I think that with his, with his visit to Greenland, he moved many minds. And we still have some minds to change still. The ice is not just beautiful for us. The ice uh, also has never been as much as it is now. The ice cap is melting away just crazy. We see icebergs, one more huge than the other, every year. Even we that are born with uh, icebergs floating right outside our houses, we are amazed, we are in deep shock, and we are, we, are, we, are, we are scared what's going to happen next. And with this masses, you will see tomorrow, maybe tonight already, tonight, later night, tonight, you start to see the first icebergs. We're going to keep you awake again. <laughs> <laughs> you, you will notice that uh, the ice is, uh, is enormous and it's beautiful and it's fantastic to be around it. This country, because of the ice retrieving, we get more and more lakes. The lakes have never been as big as they are now. And they have never been you know, flowing as much as they do now. And we take advantage of that economically. We, we build dams, smaller dams, and some places a little bit bigger. And uh, we create electricity. Greenland's electricity we use and heating in of houses, 75% of it is coming from hydro plants, hydropower. And Greenland has already been working on creating hydropower power already before Kyoto treatment was, uh, Kyoto agreement was signed in 1992. And also Greenland stands 100% behind Paris agreement. We want to be part of a global policy for cleaner, cleaner country and more sustainable country around the world. Greenlanders, we have a minimum nine years of schooling, just like you, United States, right? Nine years? Twelve? Yeah, twelve. You're smarter than us. <laughs> we have nine years of minimum schooling of, uh, in Greenland, and after that, uh, you, you have uh, high schools in Greenland, senior high schools, and you have University of Greenland, we have um, construction schools and many different kinds of schools uh, you can take in Greenland. All education in Greenland is for free. You will never pay back your whole education process, also throughout the university and PhD level, is for free. And all your medication, if you need medical assistance and you need a doctor, you need a surgery, and you need training after that, is for free. We don't charge people for that because it's we consider that any country should have this ability of treat everybody equal and everybody has the same yeah, access to education and healthcare. This is how Greenland is and uh, we have no intention of changing it. Everybody pays 42 percentage, especially now in Luke, 42 percentage of tax. That's where the tax is going to. Everybody gets uh, pension. From age 65, everybody gets the same pension. The society makes sure that you get a paycheck every month that the government, that the country is giving you. Do you know what? We also have something really awesome. Um, when you are pregnant and you have to take a maternity leave, you can take maternity leave of whole 32 weeks with pay, and you are guaranteed to go back to your to go back to your work. You will never be fired because of that. We want to enhance strong families. 
we want more children in this country because my generation, when we retire, we will be way too many for so few people to support us. It will, it will be, we will be um, devastation to the second generation economically. So we have to think new. And uh, even though we are trying that, we still only make 1.8 child per family. It's still way too little. That's because many of us are taking education first and we are making children way too late. So we have only about 1.8 child per family. But it's also half living up here. My mother's generation, they made approximately like, my mother's generation, there were 10 children in a home, which was but unusual, not unusual. But then uh, we introduced uh, family planning and prevention in about in uh, 19, mid, mid of 1960s. And the reason why is that we get fewer children today. So the children we get today, it's not because we want them. Whereas my mother's generation, a lot of them were accidents. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we would like more, uh, more children today, and uh, I don't think we do good enough today. My boyfriend has uh, six children, and I don't have any children myself. And uh, I consider them my own children, and we raise them together with his ex-wife and her new husband, and all of us, we help each other out. You have a word. Uh, that you know in your vocabulary, it's iglu. It means house. And you also have another word that's Greenlandic that you just watched out there, kayak. It's a Greenlandic word too. And you also have another word that is uh, anoa. Anoa means windstopper. That's also a Greenlandic word. And for those of you that know much of ice, you know the word nunatak. That's also uh, Greenlandic means land popping out of ice. Greenland is culturally a very strong um, singing nation. We love singing. Wherever you go, even the smallest little place, people sing. There's always a bass or an alto and a soprano and, uh, and tenor somewhere. And people just start to sing. We know our folk songs. We don't need to have songbooks in front of us to sing many, many songs that everybody sing along. When we, have, when we live in a country where there's a lot of um, dark period of time, a lot of storms, uh, where the environment is not necessarily always very good to us, we are good in keeping ourselves in company. We are good storytellers. Lots, lots, lots of people are very good storytellers. And we do a lot to, you know, to to keep up a good spirit, especially for those that have a hard time in making it through the, the, the winter. We hunt, uh, we hunt whales every year. Greenland is part of the International Whaling Commission negotiations right now that are happening. And uh, Greenland always is always under Aboriginal People's uh, uh, Hunting Commission. And uh, we get, we are facing harder and harder support from different kinds of countries. Because a lot of people have been watching the movie Willy, Free Willy. <laughs> and Free Willy was not very good to us. Because of Free Willy, a lot of people are countries that are voting either for or against voters for Aboriginal people's hunting. They start, they no longer are always reading and listening to the, the scientific and biological advice voters, and they're no longer reading the reports why it's important that the Aboriginal people around the world still should have the chance of hunting whales. Mm -hmm. They're voting according to what they, what they feel is right or wrong. I think then we are moving towards a dangerous area where people are voting according to what they feel and no longer according to what the scientists are, are coming up with. So I urge for everybody to understand that it's, it is important to listen to your scientists and listen to your naturalists and listen to the hunters' own experiences of what is right or wrong. Otherwise, the balance around the world will collapse. Thank you. This is a typical uh, picture of Iluliset where we're going tomorrow. This red building over there is, uh, is the hospital. And many of our hospitals have a view directly to the open sea and the icebergs. 
Most of our shelters homes are located in the middle of the town, so people have a chance of walking by them on their way to work or on their way home from shopping. So they're always in the center. And uh, we make big deals out of the colors of our houses. And uh, otherwise everything would be like brownish grayish, bluish, purple, and turquoise. That's the colors that we see around all the time your eye get tired, because that's the only colors that you're seeing. So we break this, uh, this Arctic colors with uh, strong, bright colors. I grew up in a yellow house. My mother's house is still yellow. It has always been yellow. We suggested several times whether she would like to paint it blue, the same shirt, same color as mine, because I think it's a nice color. She would never <coughs> change the color of her house. Are you crazy? We are supposed to be living in a yellow house. So we are in a yellow house. And uh, my family and I will live in a, in a red house, which I think is nice. The air in Greenland is like, the, it's like an Arctic desert. It's dry. You probably notice your lips are drying out, your hands are drying out, you need more lotion when you're in the Arctic. Just two days, you can always feel it. And that's because it's very dry. Even though it says temperature plus 10 when it's nice hot during summer, plus 10 Celsius degrees, even so the temperature says that, it feels like 20 because the, the, the dry air makes it feel double as nice. And in winter time, when the temperature says minus 20 Celsius, it doesn't feel that cold because it's a dry cold. And uh, that makes it actually pleasant. You can always do something against cold. You can't do anything against warm. Polar bear is just one of us in this country. Polar bear, uh, muskoxes, and many other uh, many other uh, animals that are mentioned do, do live in this country. Our polar bear stock is healthy. We have lots of them, and we have also noticed that the polar bear is, is wandering and traveling new places that they didn't before, and that's because of the ch ice behavior has changed. In Nuuk, the capital of Greenland, that is uh, the south of here. There are 18,000 people living in Nuuk. It's the biggest concentration of Inuit in one spot. It's a lot of people. <laughs> the 18,000 of them are living there. Even though there's quite a bit of activity around city or around town, last week there was a warning, polar bear warning. There was a pol three polar bears around town, around the village, so be careful. They're not asking people to shoot them. They're just asking them to be careful. So this is the time where we're up in the mountain picking berries. This is the time where we are on the rivers uh, and looking for uh, salmon. And uh, it's the season for reindeer and muskox hunting. So we are very much around. And um, it attracts the polar bear. They can smell food. And uh, they are coming closer to land. And uh, the polar bear warning, I think it went, it went well. The we didn't hear the polar bears being killed. I think they, they went somewhere else. We don't kill them just because they are nearby. We kill them for those that have a license to kill for the polar bear. The country, the government gives approximately 250 polar bear licenses a year. It can sound like a lot, but it's very little. We are in a precocious amount when we give quarters to the, to the hunters. And um, that's mainly from here north or northward and then East Greenland that we have the polar bear, unless they're traveling with the pack ice down along the southern coast of, of Greenland coming all the way from, from, from uh, East Greenland. Polar bear is called Nano in Greenlandic. And uh, it's my favorite animal. I, somehow I always have a polar bear in my dream. It's always following me. Whatever I do in my dreams, there's always a polar bear around. <clears throat> I know. <laughs> the polar bear, when we, when we catch them, we catch them not only because it's, it's huge, we catch them because it's source of meat. We eat them in northernmost region parts of Greenland and northeastern part of, Green, of, east, of East Greenland. 
The supply ships come only like one or twice a year, then the sea starts again. In these areas where there's hardly anything that, that's being brought out to them, the source of meat around is very important, otherwise they can't survive. So these regions of Greenland, they get special quota for, for polar bear. And all of the meat is being eaten, and all the skin is being used for clothes, and the claws are being used for jewelry and as uh, pieces for our, for our foods. So nothing is being wasted of all our animals, nor from our whales, nor from our seals, nor from all the animals we catch in Greenland, nothing is being wasted. They are being caught for food and for us to, to survive. This is my boyfriend, Tom. <laughs> Isn't he <it> lovely? <laughs> Tom, that's his, uh, de his white man's name, but his uh, Inuit name is Inumua. It means the beautiful Inuk, beautiful human being. He ha he's a former police officer, today, uh, today uh, attorney at court. Mm -hmm. And uh, he has actually a really nice story. So when you're around him, when you're sitting at lunch with him or somewhere, you know, just hugging him or something, um, ask him for the story because he has been attacked by a polar bear and survived. Oh. He has actually a nice story to tell this coming days. We do a lot of ice fishing. Ice fishing is one of my favorite activities in springtime. Children, women, elders uh, are out on the ice. We bring our little stove and a pot. Anything that we catch fresh, we make a nice fish roof out on, on the ice and have a really nice chat. And uh, fishing is the main income of Greenlanders. We fish halibut, cod, shrimp, uh, redfish, and uh, snow crab. These are the main incomes for, for us uh, in Greenland. And the second income is from tourism. Greenland is not working towards mass tourism. You would never see other people in the same fjord as you are. Greenland is huge, and we want to keep it as it is and uh, there are no roads going from one place to the other. Do you know who that person is in that group? No, I don't know him. Okay. Sorry. Um, by the way, all the pictures I've, I've taken, uh, they are from visitgreenland.com. Visitgreenland.com. Visit Visit and, um, and tourism, ecotourism is the second for Greenland. We have no roads connecting us from one place to the other. Either you have to go with your boat, or your dinghy, or, or one passenger ship is going up and down. Otherwise, you have to fly. So these are the comp uh, possibilities you have to visit each other. And uh, that itself limits also amount of people that can travel in one place. You are, you are dependent on the, the <coughs> infrastructural uh, flights than just hopping into a car and go around the country as you can on Iceland. We don't do that. And I don't think that any roads from one place to the other will ever be built. You don't build tunnels and huge roads that are connected from one, one town to the other 500 kilometers for 56,000 people. Come on. <laughs> it, says, it says it all. And Greenland is a very rich country regarding minerals. Minerals is also another discussion that we have a lot in politically in Greenland. Greenland has gold. Greenland has the biggest deposit of rare earths in South Greenland. If we are to open a mine in South Greenland for, for rare earths, we will be breaking China's monopoly. China today has the, the monopoly around the world, so we will be changing the economy of Chinese in many ways also will have an influence on that. Because of that, and also the Greenlanders are the owners of our subsoil, that means we own anything that is underneath us, and if we are to start the mining, the, all the income goes to the Greenlanders. We negotiated that Back in uh, 1920, uh, back in 2007, 6, 8, and inaugurated the new Self Rule Act of Greenland in 2009. The Self Rule Act says Greenlandic is the official language. Greenlanders can, if they want, by themselves decide when we want to declare ourselves independent. And Greenlanders can at all times take over the jurisdiction that are under Danish jurisdiction today if Greenlanders do feel that they're ready for that. At the same time, Greenlanders are the owners of all 
riches, both on land, on sea, on air. We are the owners of it. We negotiated that. We wanted that. And Greenlanders, 75% of us want independency. We want to be masters in our own house. We want to make any decisions that has about to do about your life in, in this country. That's a natural thing to do. And 75% uh, of the population want that. And we never met any fight against that from the Danish side, which is very nice. Greenland and Denmark have negotiated several act, which internationally also have been seen as best practice on how a uh, former colony can become, create or reach greater autonomy through negotiations in that level that we did not have any crisis in between. We have no bloodshed, no demonstration, no nothing, but good negotiation and clear talking both ways. And I think that uh, as indigenous country, as indigenous people, we are very proud that we reached this way. Today, many indigenous organizations and people around the world, especially on the United Nations, are looking at us to see how we are doing it. And the Salvador Act is being studied very carefully by other indigenous groups around the world. So we are very proud that we got this way. When we are living in a country that is the biggest island of the world, at the same time, the smallest population probably in the earth with 56,000 people only. So how do we negotiate with countries like China? How do we negotiate with countries like U European Union? How do you do that? How do you disappear? It's very important, even though having a strong governance in a country is not the question of how many you are. It's very important when you're working with uh, international policies and uh, international diplomacy, it's very important that you use the international instrument. Use the international instrument that bonds and makes forces you together with the partner that you're dealing with to a good agreement. Always make sure that the human rights are at all times very strongly top of your agenda. That this country that you want to work with do respect the Universal Declaration of Indigenous Peoples' Rights at all times are also on their agenda. ILO Convention Article 169 is also very, very important to make sure that the country that you're dealing with do understand what it is important to you as a people. And besides that, the self rule Act of Greenland, where we are standing jurisdictionally, is also very important for our partners to understand. So in this years, a lot of companies from outside are coming to Greenland and want to open a mine because we have uh, rare earths, we have gold, we have diamonds, we have molybdenum, and we have zinc and lead and uh, lead deposits that are of economic interest depending on you know, world market. Greenland adopted unanimously in the parliament of Greenland the new minerals act that probably is one of the toughest mineral acts in the world. We are not to open mines at all costs, just to get quick money and we can become independent next week. We are doing it because we are people that do res show respect to our environment and we still want a good environment also after the mines have closed down. What we require of our partners outside it's very hard, but we always say that if they can live up to it, they're most welcome. If they think that's way too hard, maybe they should do something somewhere else. So we don't do any hazard with that, and I think this is, uh, this is what sets the standards for us and on the international market for how to govern in a place that has a very uh, fragile environment. It requires applause, right? Have you tried Hannah Rachel Sauer? <laughs> Man, it's good. We have, uh, we have very harsh winters. It can look so nice as you saw today, but during winter, this is a typical picture of one of the, one of the towns here. The wind is so strong, and the blizzard is so strong and cold that there's a whiteout. You can't drive out because it's all white. We close down schools. All the children have to come home. We make an announcement at the radio. Close, uh, the radio is closed. 
So we are closing the radio. The police is not asking people to go out. It's the best time ever as family. We make pancakes and we, we you know, we, we do things and you know, the children love that. We do. We have day off. And it's with pay still. And uh, but we have noticed that our storms, like you also probably experienced that in the United States, the storms are going mad. They're more often there, and it's colder and it's it's terrible. We see that so much more this year. And this year our summer has been so cold that we haven't had a chance of sitting outside to barbecue. It's, it's too cold. We didn't do it once, even though we think that we are pretty much like hardcore Arctic people. We we couldn't do that. So we haven't done we. We took our grill out, and it's in again. <laughs> this is a, a picture of, uh, of a dark period of time. A lot of people thinking that during the dark time, it's absolute dark. No, it's not. It's like twilight. It's like everything is bluish, turquoise. It's beautiful. Even though it's a dark period of time, where I'm from, the sun sets uh, the first week of November, and we don't see it peaking over the mountain again until February 4th. So we have quite a few months where we, we don't see the sun, but it's all right, we, we grow up with that. And this is how we do it. And we get, we get to do the sewing that we saw this afternoon. We have lots of time to do that. We can uh, tell stories. Uh, men are preparing their guns and rifles and and uh, harpoons getting ready for the ice to set and we can go out again with the light compact. And it's also a very ni nice time where all the families are together. All the men that we normally always are outside, they're, they're home. Lots of children are born in September. <laughs> I'm, I'm one of them. <laughs> it's, it's a beautiful time. It's also the time where you get to see a lot of northern lights. For us, it's very normal to see northern lights. We didn't, we didn't even go up to deck last night when we heard the Northern Lights. And, and we, heard, we heard Peter saying he has never seen anything like it. And we were saying like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this winter we have noticed that, last winter we have noticed that our Northern Lights are going mad. There are lots of them. Last night, uh, last winter, several times during winter we all had to go out of the building and just look out up in the sky, because normally you would see some there, you would see some there, but this winter you have seen the whole sky be full. That's very unusual, everything full, one day after the other. I don't know why, some scientists have to explain that, but our northern light guarantee is, is very high. Remember to blow, to whistle, whistle tonight. Mm. This is a picture of uh, a si uh, it's of Nuuk, the capital of Greenland, during dark period of times. This picture is taken approximately five in the afternoon, Christmas time. It's beautiful. You would go out in school in a twilight like this, and you would go out, go home again, still twilight. And it's you have to have a certain mindset to survive that in winter, when you're not used to have lots of dark period of time and such. Do things. It forces you to read or uh, find entertainment or get creative and visit people and get social. And, uh, and I think that I always say, if you don't know what romance is, you get romantic, trust me. As I said, uh, our food source is from right out there. And uh, that's how we want to keep it this way as well. A lot of countries are misunderstanding us for being cruel to animals, and a lot of people are thinking that uh, we are doing it. Why don't you just make a living out of, or live out of what the supermarket is providing for you? But this is not what it is. This is so much more. This is a photo of Nuuk, and any ordinary evening last winter when we had so much snow uh, all over. When we are going to Ludiset, we start to see icebergs this size. This is even not, nothing big. But you will notice that no iceberg is the same. No iceberg has the same shape. And no same iceberg is standing in one place. Everything is a constant move. And an iceberg makes sound. 
when you're quiet, standing next to an ice, uh, to the ice, uh, when you go to the, how do you call it, boardwalk in Iluliset, I can absolutely recommend that. Also the boat tour is absolutely recommended. It's fantastic. To stop the engine, you can hear the ice all over. It's really, really, really nice. This is a picture that's taken in Iluliset, where we're going tomorrow. This is only just to show you that this is the, about the, si the sizes that icebergs are, where we are nearing. And also, uh, some icebergs are male icebergs, and this is a female iceberg. <laughs> it is, it is, they call it that. I know, it's a very naughty country. <laughs> and, and this one, I don't know what to call. <laughs> This is a picture of uh, the mother of the children and her new husband, and, and me and my boyfriend. Apologies for the interruption, but we do appear to have some fin whales just up ahead of the ship right now. I hope you enjoyed the trip. Uh, you enjoyed it. <laughs>